minus five minutes and counting. There's been another mass shooting in America. This time in a... Well, that's a lot of rain, and uh, that is happening where the monsoon season is going on right now in the desert southwest. And you guys know the drill if you live down there. Uh, you've got these storms. You can never pinpoint exactly where the rain's going to fall, but when it does, I mean, you can get a storm that will only drop about an inch, inch and a half of rain, and that will totally flood everything. So why is that? I mean, maybe you're watching this from somewhere like Houston, and you're like, guys, it takes like 15 inches of rain to flood this place. Not in the desert southwest, because here's the deal. It's so dry that when the rain falls, really the ground just can't absorb it just because of the dryness. And what ends up happening is all that rain just accumulates because it can't go down. You've also got areas where you've got some topography, a few mountains here and there, and that will uh, drain down into the valleys where, by the way, there are usually some creeks and streams and riverbeds and things like that. And that is how you end up with these really bad flooding situations. You know, not only just the flash flooding. Of Whoa, now the wind is going real Some of America's biggest cities could look a lot different by the year 2100 as a result of climate change. The online real estate database Zillow created maps showing how many homes would no longer exist if sea levels rise by just six feet. That's how much NOAA says sea levels could rise if climate change continues unchecked. Zillow estimates that nationwide almost 2 million homes would be at the risk of being underwater. And more than half of those homes would be in Florida, where Zillow predicted one in eight homes would be lost. In some cities, the damage would be concentrated in low-lying areas, while in other places with many small rivers and tributaries, the damage would be more spread out. Zillow's chief economist said that homeowners will have to consider rising sea levels impact on homes more closely as we move through this century. On the road, on the cars. Caterpillars have been raining down from the sky in this neighborhood in Chengdu, southwest China's Sichuan province. Bojelo Street looks no different from other communities in the city, but despite the heat, the creepy creatures have kept local residents away from the shade of trees. There weren't so many of them in the past years, but this year many caterpillars were falling from the sky. It makes us feel itchy when it lands on our skin. It's quite out of the ordinary. These caterpillars are the lava of lucky moth. They climb up to the trees when it gets hot. These creatures usually turn into the moth in the summer. In order to keep the streets clean, local forestry officials have been spraying pesticide on the trees. Scientists have been monitoring large swarms of small quakes near Mount Spur, a volcano in southern Alaska. They've been recording hundreds of quakes stronger than 2.4 since the 11th of July. Experts say it's unlikely that these small quakes originate along fault lines in the earth. Instead, they say it's more likely just the ground shaking from the nearby pothole glacier. The seismic events can originate with the actions of slow moving glaciers in steep terrain and some good news these small quakes aren't strong enough to cause any damage
eruptions that are going on and they've actually disrupted some flights in Indonesia. Now the eruptions are going on on Lombok Island near Bali. You've got Sinabung Volcano on Mount Rinjani on Sumatra and then Gamalama in the Malukas chain of islands. Now nobody's been injured so that's some good news but there's been a whole lot of smoke and ash. Now the other good news is that nearby towns and farms are not in any danger but since eruptions last year more than 13,000 people have been evacuated and that was mainly from from around the Sinabung volcano. The three mountains are among about 130 active volcanoes in Indonesia. Here's the 11 o'clock advisory from Tropical Storm Earl. 70 miles per hour, only a few more miles per hour to go before it becomes Hurricane Earl later today. Making landfall tomorrow, probably before sunrise, somewhere around 5 a.m. or so, as a hurricane in Belize, and then eventually across the Yucatan Peninsula. Not a significant hurricane, not a big Category 2 or 3, just a Category 1, but still making winds, waves, and probably some storm surge. And certainly heavy rain across the higher elevations could pick up 10 inches to a foot, and that could cause some... Officials say the worst is over, although the winds are still blowing hard in Belize. Tourists in many coastal hotels were forced out of their rooms after losing power. It was very scary. It was very scary. Uh, it was very windy. Um, a lot of rain came into our room. The wind was very, very strong. We saw the uh, uh, air conditioners on the roof coming apart and blowing across and it, uh, projectiles from that, so very dangerous. Earl had been a hurricane overnight, but by mid-morning, maximum sustained winds had dropped to 65 miles per hour. The National Hurricane Center says the system will weaken to a tropical depression, but is still expected to bring 8 to 12 inches of rain in the region through Friday morning. killed overnight in a stabbing spree in central London. Five other people were hurt in the knife attack in an area popular with tourists. A 19-year-old suspect is in custody. Police have stepped up security. Elizabeth Palmer is at the scene of the stabbings in London's Russell Square with the latest details. Elizabeth, good morning. Good morning. Witnesses have told us that a man began attacking people with a knife, apparently at random, just after 10.30 here last night. Police showed up almost immediately and tasered him, but by then, uh, the American woman, the victim, was lying, dying on the pavement, and five other people had been wounded, one of those also a U.S. citizen. We don't know the name of the attacker, but we do know he was a Norwegian citizen of Somali descent, and he's now being charged with murder. Uh, the police wondered whether this was a terrorist attack, but they've now ruled that out. They say he was simply mentally ill. 
Uh, this incident has rattled Londoners, understandably. There have been six terrorist attacks in Europe since the beginning of June alone, and the police have been very candid, telling Britons, for you, it's probably a case of when, not if. By and large, police officers don't carry our, uh, firearms in this country. Uh, but just yesterday, the police announced they were adding thousands of armed officers to the forces across the country over the next couple of years in response to the heightened uh, terrorist threat. at 11 o'clock, drivers get an eyeful on the 15 a Caltrans traffic sign hacked. A political slam targeting Donald Trump put up. 10 News reporter Bree Stephan is live at 15 and Adams Avenue. And Bree, it was a prank, but Caltrans says this was dangerous. That's right, and Caltrans told me that signs like these are locked and password protected, but somehow someone got past all of that. Happy to sit there and look at it. These sisters have lots to talk about today. I, mean, I can imagine what it must have been like for the people that were trying to go to work today. Yeah. Someone hacked this road sign, putting political name calling on blast. Hey, how did they even get up there? A good question, one that Caltrans is trying to figure out. Oh, I can't believe we saw that message on there. <laughs> Mike and Jeffrey were walking their dogs when they saw the slur. The F word, Trump, and then KKK. Oh my gosh, KKK. Hmm. That's terrible. Mike shot this video of a police officer trying to figure out how to turn off the insulting sign. And the poor police officer, he had trouble sh turning off the sign, so he turned it off and apparently it turned itself back on, so. <laughs> Caltrans says whoever did it put drivers in danger by distracting them. All gone now, but some still shocked they got to see it firsthand. Uh, I couldn't believe it, could not believe it. <laughs> And Caltrans says they turned off that slur within the hour. Tonight, though, the sign is back up and running like it should be with the message ramp closed. Reporting live in Kensington, Bree Steffen, 10 News. Correspondent Milad Fadl and cameraman Mohammed Khair and Haq survived, suffering only minor injuries in that blast. The team took shelter inside the building for seven hours while shelling went on around them. The bombing in that area is intense. One minute we were thinking we were going to die, but luckily we survived just being injured by the blasts. We're talking about more than 60 explosions happening every minute. The gunmen went for maximum impact, attacking in broad daylight. They opened fire at a market outside the town of Kokrajar. It was packed with shoppers. The extremists shot at the market and killed 12 people. In our operation so far, one militant has been neutralized. We have also recovered a few AK-56s and grenades from him. Efforts are ongoing to catch remaining militants. Police and paramilitary troops engaged in a shootout with the attackers. Inspecting the scene, the state leader announced a compensation package for victims. We are giving $7,500 to the family of each victim and $1,500 to those severely injured. We're also giving $300 to those who sustained light injuries. The army is blaming the attack on rebels from the National Democratic Front of Bodoland. They're fighting for an independent state for the Bodo ethnic group. On Tuesday, four Bodo separatists were arrested in the town and a cache of weapons was seized. This is as good a time as any to remind the public that these groups like this are still around, that they cannot be controlled just by the force of arms until you know, they come to a process of dialogue and discussion as other groups have done. Unrest in Assam is not uncommon. Two years ago, thousands of people fled from the area following a spate of coordinated attacks but a mass shooting of this kind is unprecedented here. Gerald Tan, Al Jazeera. A suspect caught on tape dragging an Edmund police officer outside, kicking, punching, and trying to grab for the officer's gun. As another officer comes to restrain him, here comes an innocent bystander who helps take him down. I would describe as some 
wrestling moves wrapped the suspect up. Police say it all started when a group of people tried buying gift cards with stolen credit cards. The guy on video, 32-year-old Johanker Paradella Moreau, is now facing aggravated assault and battery charges of an officer and obstructing justice. As police try to find the other people involved who are seen driving away during the fight, Officers want to thank this man for the assist. Not just offering our thanks, but, you know, an accommodation and an award for being helpful. Brett Bogansky, KOCO 5 News. It's right now T-shirts promoting the White Marlin Open in Ocean City, drawing some fire from the NAACP. The shirts feature an image of a marlin accompanied by the words White Lives Matter, and the other shirts say Blue Lives Matter. They're sold by a marina in Ocean City, and they're meant to raise awareness of marlin conservation. The designer says he does not intend to stir up controversy. The U.S. has been increasing its military deployments in the Asia-Pacific region since it shifted its strategic focus to the region several years ago. The U.S. has deployed 368,000 military personnel in the Asia-Pacific and now have eight major military base complex in the region, about 40 percent of its overseas total. The biggest is the Northeast Asia complex. It includes 109 bases and over 37,000 personnel in Japan and 83 military bases and over 28,000 personnel a in South Korea. A new twist tonight Korea. in the Pokemon Go craze. A Bay Area man's devotion to the game landed him behind bars. The deputies say he pulled out a gun and fired at another driver. Our Jacqueline Inglés spoke to both drivers about what started it all. Uh, right here is where the uh, round that he shot at the truck. It's how this truck's back window ended up shattered that's up for debate tonight. Oh, I thought. Does he have a gun? Because he was holding something out the window, which looked like a gun. Tampa business owner Kyle Zavalio says he was heading to work when he pulled up behind this red Toyota Corolla here at this rural Crystal River intersection Wednesday morning. It's the only thing Zavalio and the driver of the Corolla, Jimmy Ritchie, are agreeing on. We were playing Pokemon Go at 5.30 in the morning. This guy pulls up behind us at the stop sign. He was obviously in a hurry because we were taking our time. Richie, who asked us not to show his face, says after making a left-hand turn, Zavalio ran him and his girlfriend off the road by cutting them off. He made me fear for my life, so I wanted to scare him to back off. Richie admits he pulled out a pellet gun. That's when I pulled out my fake gun. It had no clip, had no ammo, no nothing in it, and I shot it firing four shots into the sky, not at his truck or anything. Nothing came out of the gun. Zavalio is telling a different story. He admits pulling in front of Richie, but says that's when Richie started chasing him, pulling alongside him and opening fire. Pointing the gun out the window, telling me if I wanted to F around that he would F and kill me. Richie denies threatening Zavalio's life. Deputies say he willingly handed over the pellet gun. It was unloaded, and they couldn't find any ammo at his house or in his car. Whether it's a pellet gun or not, a firearm is a firearm. In Citrus County, Jacqueline Inglis, ABC Action News. North Korean space officials are hard at work on a five-year plan to put more advanced satellites into orbit by 2020 and don't intend to stop there. After finishing this plan, we will try a space trip to the moon. In an interview with the Associated Press, a senior official at North Korea's version of NASA said international sanctions won't stop the country from launching more satellites by 2020. Even though the U.S. and its allies try to block our space development, our aerospace developers will definitely explore space and put the flag of North Korea on the moon. An unmanned, no-frills North Korean moon mission in the not-too-distant future isn't as far-fetched as it might seem. Some outside experts say it's ambitious but conceivable. Others say North Korea's aerospace developments are quite unrealistic, considering the country's current economic situation. North Korea is speaking of a moon expedition or sticking its national flag on the surface of the moon seems to be propaganda because to actually explore the moon, not only do you need a transportation means, but more importantly, a great amount of money. The North's technological capabilities may be another issue. Only looking at North Korea's satellite launches up to this point, I think that the technology has not reached a level to that of commercial satellites or military reconnaissance satellites. North Korea currently has two satellites in orbit, KMS-32 and KMS-4. It put its first satellite in orbit in 2012, a feat few other countries, including rival South Korea, have ever achieved.
0032 Emniyet içerisinde tedbir alan silahlı personelin yola çıkarak darbecileri engellemeye çalışmalıdır. Saat 0035 Darbeciler tarafından polislere silahlarla ateş açılması. another mass shooting in America, this time in a 